audience that he had me on. Yes, I'm sure you did. Okay. Tried to throw my earring at him. But <laughs> Where? I hit El Pacino in the eye. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> well, score says he loses again. I was, I was heartbroken. Oh, God, it was horrible. It was horrible. the horrible. worst. Okay, Robert, we're clear. Are we close? Mm -hmm. And Kurt, you're up. Okay. Um, tour films, I think music tour films are always a cliche by now. You follow a band around. This yeah. is nothing like any other tour film that's ever been done, I don't mm -hmm. think, since the Rolling Stones, maybe. Did you start out to make this kind of movie or to just kind of evolve this way? It, it evolved, yeah. We started out just wanting to basically document what we were doing on stage and get a, some backstage footage yeah. to sort of, you know, shoot some black and white backstage stuff to cut away and <clears throat> um, give you a sense of being on the road, you know. But uh, then I got more interested in the backstage footage. So well, the backstage took over. Right? It absolutely took over. I mean, and and my rationalization for that was that. Uh, I thought it is a live medium. Yeah. You know, people will, most people will, will already have seen the show that want to see the show, and uh, to try and really fully capture that completely, I don't think you'll ever, I think you'll always sell it short. Yeah. So let's concentrate on the backstage stuff because that certainly was more interesting to me. And um, I mean, we didn't really know exactly what we were doing, but. When you were watching the, the rushes, or if you're watching the footage of this and you see yourself in it without makeup and you're wearing this little shower hat and stuff, did you think, gee, should I be doing this? I mean, No, I said, ooh, I look really grody good. <laughs> <laughs> Why would that be good? Well, because everybody has a preconceived notion about me, you know, because I love to be glamorous and stuff. But, no. I mean, to show uh, other dimensions, you have to sort of be willing to get down to the nitty-gritty, undressed, so to speak. <laughs> is this a, do you think this is a totally honest movie, the way it's come out? Totally honest. Is there anything you've held back at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, but I, I, there's, there's no way that you could have seen every aspect of my life in two hours. No, I mean, true. the camera, even if the camera followed me around for my entire life, you know, how can you ever really completely know me? And, but a, even a lie is very telling. So, um, you know, I'm not one of those people that think, oh, they know that the camera's on, they're not telling the truth. I mean, if you go into a psychiatrist's office and you say, you know, you sort of change the truth a little bit or you make, you know, or whatever, there, there's still something revealing about that. Even a performer who's actually on stage performing, there's something revealing about their, their yeah. persona, their personality, their character. Do you seek out, so, seek out in your own life? Do you seek total honesty in every situation? Or are you? I seek people? it out. I, am, I can't say that I'm always victorious. But doesn't, doesn't uh, if, if everyone were totally honest 24 hours a day, wouldn't somebody wind up getting hurt eventually? Yes, because the truth does hurt. I mean, honesty is a frightening concept to most people. But on the other hand, if people got used to it, maybe it wouldn't be so frightening. And that's, that's part of the whole thing about the movie. There's a lot of frightening concepts in the movie, yeah. which I think if people would allow themselves to be more open to on a day-to-day -day basis, it wouldn't be so frightening. It's like yeah. there's there's a there's a, a girl uh, I guess a high school friend of yours Moira turns up in this movie, and she's had a tough time. Obviously, she wants you to be the godmother of her baby, and yeah. then, then you reveal out of nowhere that this is a woman who taught you how to make out and use tampons and introduced yeah. you to digital manipulation. I suppose yes. we could say. Mm -hmm. That's that's. I don't think it was cruel, but it's it's so frank. I mean, she would probably be devastated. I would imagine. Don't I don't you? think she'd be devastated. Mm -hmm. In fact, she knew I was saying those things because she responds to my questions yeah. in, an, in another interview. That she's, like, in other words, Alec, the director, was went back to her and said, "Madonna says you did this, this, this," and she would look into the camera and yeah. frankly answer the question. I think if she didn't want to deal with it, she wouldn't have did it on camera. Yeah. You know, she wouldn't have dealt with it. And how do you think she comes off in this? She seems. I think she comes off as um, a fragile human being, but I do think that she comes off as a, a person that loves me, that cares for me. I mean, and and uh, and ultimately, I feel that I come off the same way. But the the thing about Moira was that I really didn't, I hadn't seen her in so many years, yeah. and the meeting that we have in the hallway is a surprise. The director set the whole thing up and had her there waiting while I'm rushing out to go to a sound check. Yeah. My head is spinning. I'm thinking about a million things. The next day is the Dick Tracy premiere, whatever, and I'm thinking. Oh my God! Now I have to deal with this. I mean, it's like a, an explosion from my past, yeah. you know. And um, those things that I said about Moira were, um, you know, part of an interview that Alec conducted where he was asking me about her and stuff. And it was really a coincidence that in Japan I start talking about her. You know, I said to my makeup artist, you know, you remind me of somebody. 
And then it was a coincidence that I would happen to run no. into her because I had no idea where she lived. So there's another. There's another. Uh, we don't meet a lot of your family in here. We know you have one brother on tour with you. He's an yeah. artist, but we meet Martin, your other brother, mm -hmm. in this, and he turns up and he's obviously he's sort of trying to convince people that he's pretty tight with you too. It's mm -hmm. not entirely convincing. Well, he's a bit of a con artist. <laughs> And That's the charming thing about my brother. And then, but then you're telling this the security guy if he turns up with his entourage, watch him because my brother's crazy. And then yeah. he turns up late, and you've gone to bed. Yeah. And this is all being filmed. Well, about has to, five hours late. Well, yeah. He has to crawl out with his tail between his legs and his friends with him. It's it's so touching, you know. I, yeah, I, but that's that's life, isn't it? I mean, I wanted to show a slice of my life. Yeah. That's part of my life, and uh, in a sense, that is a, a you know, a, a microcosmic. Uh, sort of display of my relationship with my brother. I mean, I have, I adore my brother, you know, but he's, he's, he's a real con artist. And in a way, he's a, he's a great actor. He's yeah. very entertaining. He has sort of a, a very dark sense of humor. And um, that's just, I like the juxtaposition of, of my relationship with my brother Christopher and my relationship with my brother Martin, you know, because Christopher's very much a part of my life yeah. and always has been, you know. He, when I left and moved to New York, he came to New York too and we, are very often, you know, working in the same worlds, whether it's dance or theater or art or whatever. And my brother Martin has a very separate life from mine. He stayed in Michigan. He does yeah. very different things. He has different interests. He evolved in a different way. So I wanted to show that, you know, even yeah. though he's my brother, the, the differences, you know, of somebody. And that happens with friends. I mean, there's, there are people that, that sort of grow with you and come up with you and you relate to them. And then there's people that, they sort of went off on their own thing and did yeah. their own thing. So you mentioned in the movie that uh, people talk about how stardom changes you, but yeah. they don't talk about how it changes other people's attitudes or you. Does that, does that apply to your family also? Do they react to you I, in a different way? Yeah, to a certain extent. Um, but you have to understand, my family's, you know, used to me for a lot longer than everybody they, else. So, you know, and I, I th actually think they do a pretty good job of dealing with it all. They. Um, my father's very good at sort of making sure that you know nobody gets treated differently than I, yeah. I certainly don't get any sort of star treatment when I go home and and he's as interested in the accomplishments of my other brothers and sisters as he is in mine so um, but it is to a certain extent like I have certain brothers and sisters that don't like to call me by my first name now because the whole world calls me <laughs> by my first name so they call me by my middle name <laughs> what do so. they call you Louise. <coughs> Louise? Mm -hmm. You don't seem like a Louise. I'm not sure if that would work. I'm sorry you feel that way, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's like Kevin Costner also crops up in this. I thought it was really hilarious. I mean, yeah. did you? Does he? Is he aware that his little that vignette in here is going to yes. be in the movie? Yeah. He's no. He knows it. How does he feel about that? I don't know. I haven't asked him. <laughs> but do you have his phone number? I mean, we could call him up right now. Well, maybe afterwards. No, I don't. You know, I, 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 I don't. Uh, I know I'm making fun of him to a certain extent. I'm basically, you know, I think Kevin has this sort of real Jimmy Stewart, aw shucks <laughs> kind of image, you know, and, I, and, you know, I just was teasing him about it. And uh, I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable about showing that scene in the movie if I didn't make fun of myself constantly throughout the whole movie. So. No. Did you, has, has your father gotten used to the fact now? I know he's, he's saying in, the, in this film, he's, he's objecting to the sexy parts of the show and says, I know, it's already, it's already. And has he, has he gotten used to the fact that you're sort of. I, I, I think I think his uh, I think his um, you know his kind of uh, you know, protesting of it you know is almost like a, a reflex more than a because I know he expects it of me now and yeah. he doesn't you know well it's a little it's a little you know it was a little racy in some sections <laughs> well you know I mean he would never be specific yeah. with me and then I go yeah yeah right dad and then <laughs> and then we go on to the next subject. Yeah. So. Why, did you, why did you decide to go to your mother's uh, grave site? That seemed like maybe pushing it. I, I'm sure some people will feel you're, that's pushing things too far to take a camera crew to your mother's grave. I mean, mm -hmm. Do you think it was tasteless? Or? Why, what's tasteless about <coughs> it? My mother's death is a big part of my life. Yeah, but taking a camera crew there, I think people might say, well... Well, they would probably th think, if they were uh, offended by that, then they would think that the interview with my friend Moira and my brother Martin and, and all the other re really revealing things yeah. would be, I would think they would find the whole thing offensive. Do you think some of your fans might? I mean, your fans go down to, I'm sure, 12 and below, no doubt. Do you think this is a movie for all of them? Do you think everybody should see it, or should it just be... It's an R-rated film. Now. It's an R-rated film. I think that uh, teenagers could certainly see it. Um, beneath the age of, what I don't know, like 13 or something, I would, you know, I think it would be good if a parent 
if the kid like insisted they wanted to see it, that their parent was there to make sure to explain things to them that they didn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Did the um, you, you also mentioned here that uh, your mother, when your mother died, you you, you thought that. Uh, you couldn't understand what she had done wrong, and you wondered if you had done something wrong. Is, is guilt right. like a part of the, a Catholic guilt sort of thing, a motivating part of what you do? Yeah, I would say <clears> so. <throat> I mean, one of the many motivating things in my life, guilt. Yeah, sure. Have you gotten beyond it? I mean, have you? Uh, little by little, but it's very slow progress, you know, because um, I don't know, there's a certain kind of humility that's taught in the Catholic Church, yeah. you know, and there's a constant striving and a, a, a certain work ethic and an idea that, you know, you're not supposed to really indulge yourself too much and to have many sensual pleasures or things yeah. like that. And, and uh, one is brought up to believe in those things and to sort of live a puritanical life. And so you think, wow, I live in this beautiful house in the Hollywood Hills and, and I can, you know, um, you know, have private planes, and I can have all these luxuries, and every once in a while you go, but God, you know, do I deserve it? And, you know, and, you know, and I look at my f friends and members of my family who aren't as lucky as I've been, and, yeah. you know, of course, then I, uh, that also makes me feel guilty. Do you look know? at it as luck, or do you not just look at it as achievement? Absolutely achievement. I worked very hard for what I have, but, but I'm, I, I was lucky to have the, the nerve and the, and the courage to, to do yeah. what, I, what I do. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, let's face it, most people who've gone through what I've gone through would have a very long tail between their legs. <laughs> would they? So, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I, didn't, I mentioned to you before we started here that uh, this woman, Camille Paglia, who is an art professor in Philadelphia, wrote, who wrote a book called uh, Sexual Persona, mm -hmm. Attacking Academic Feminists, wrote in the New York Times when uh, Justify My Love came out that. It, she thought it was pornographic. She thought it was great. MTV shouldn't have shown it. And Madonna is the future of feminism. Uh -huh. And I'm sure a lot of feminists, pro feminists probably disagree with this. Do you hear from academic feminists a lot? Um, I'm made aware of a lot of articles that are written. I know that uh, at one point, I know they were teaching some course on me at Brown University. Madonna 101? Or... Something like that, yeah. And uh, I've met to, for instance, I was in the south of France, and this girl came up to me, and she said she was a, you know, she was a, like a hardcore feminist, yeah. and to get, you know, working on her masters. I don't know if it was at Harvard or whatever, but, and she was very, you know, she had all this literature that she th said my name came up a lot in, and she said it was a, I was the topic of many discussions. But she was very like into me and what yeah. I was doing, and she thought it was great, and so I knew that I had. Um, so I, I was, I'm aware of certain aspects. I also know that uh, Bella Abzug attended one of my right. concerts in New York, which I thought was hysterical. <laughs> I mean, I'm flattered, you know. I yeah. mean, I, I mean, do you, do you see yourself? Do you ever think about femi feminism yourself, or do you, do you just see yourself carrying out your life? I I'm mean, carrying out my yeah. life. I mean, I think about humanism. I don't. Uh, I feel. I think the things that I feel like need to be changed. Yeah. I mean, I'm. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of, of sexism. I'm aware of racism. I'm aware of homophobia. I'm aware of all of these things. Yeah. When I started out, I didn't go, okay, these are all these things, these subjects. It's just the, that I want to tackle, that I want to attack head on, that I want to try and make a change yeah. about. But that's sort of the way my life's gone. And, and it's almost a, it's a responsibility that sort of fell on my lap that I, that I actually welcome. Yeah. No. I think what Professor Paglia is saying is that uh, feminism has failed because it's forgotten about pleasure, and you're bringing that back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Did you? Uh, there's also a, there's a, a vignette in the uh, in the film which shows a gay pride parade in New mm -hmm. York and has queer nation is in there. I wonder if you're aware of the um, the group in New York that is now putting out uh, posters that say absolutely queer, and I'll have a picture of a very hot young actress or mm -hmm. a very well known. TV. Outing. Yeah. Yes. How do you? What do you think of that practice? I think it's a tough one. You know, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a, um, it's an explosive issue, really. You yeah. know, um, on the one hand, I can see the the their point of view, the people that want to out people, and saying, you know, if you people, people in powerful positions would come out and say they were gay, then then the masses of the people that don't understand, or the people that have prejudice against homosexuals and gay lifestyles or whatever would see 
you know, would get rid of their stereotypes that, that gay yeah. people are, you know, perverts or whatever, you know. If, if some, if, you know, a handful of powerful people would just have the courage to come forth, I, th I think that's their point, you know, and saying, but uh, on the other hand, um, that the other side of the argument is, you know, I'll come out when I'm ready to come out, or I'll say yeah. my sexuality or my sexual preference is nobody's business. You know, I mean, there's two sides of the story. That's but I think that dominates the argument, though, doesn't it? I mean, people yeah. have a right to say what they want when Absolutely. they want to say it. Absolutely, yeah. And also, yeah. how do you know these people, people are People do have the, the right to say what they want to say. It's unfortunate that, that, that there aren't more outspoken people on gay rights, you know, that are in yeah. powerful positions. Yeah. You know, that, that's the unfortunate aspect of it. And, and, and it's unfortunate that saying somebody's gay is such a frightening thing in the world yeah. today that, that, that it's such a frightening concept, you know? No doubt to some extent because of AIDS, I would imagine. Absolutely right? because of AIDS, yeah. yeah. You're the the, the uh, premieres for this movie are going to be AIDS benefits, I yeah. gather, are they not? Mm -hmm. And you continue trying to do something. Do you read up on that? Do you try and keep a, up with what's going on medically with AIDS? And yeah, I try to. Mm -hmm. I try to. Um, Obviously, I mean, every it used to be in the newspapers all the time. Now it's not like front page it's stories not a hot topic anymore. anymore. Yeah, but I get um, literature from Matilda Krim and and you know APLA and Amfar and stuff. In, as far as you know, recent developments in uh, experimental medications and stuff yeah. like that. So, yeah. Okay. The. Um I wonder. I wonder. Did, there's. It's in the film. There's the, your visit to Toronto is per, portrayed, and we had origi originally understood that you actually had to leave Toronto, escape Toronto, essentially, and run away. Is that what happened there? What was the yeah, upshot we, of all that? Yeah, we didn't. Well, I didn't really know until I was told that they could. They will, if they're going to arrest you, they will be waiting for you at the end of the show. So the idea was, okay, well, if they don't, they may change their minds. So we better get the hell out of here, you know, before they do change their minds. So in other words, don't go back to the hotel and spend the night and leave the next yeah. day. So we sort of packed up and were ready to go. Um, Beat a retreat out of the fascist yeah. state of Toronto, I yes, believe you exactly. referred to it. Huh? He got out of Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> will you be going back there ever again? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Do you think there's a there's a momentum in, in what you do that you constantly have to top yourself? I mean, especially after this movie, after Justify no, My Life. It's not an idea that I, the idea isn't that I have to top myself, but that I have to, you know, go. I have to expand my own horizons and and tackle the next yeah. issue or go further in terms of creativity and 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 what it is I want to say and what it is I want to do. I mean, I don't want to just keep doing the same thing and saying the same yeah. thing. And uh, the, the thing is that the issues that I'm interested in life are, are generally controversial issues. So it seems that I'm trying to do that, you know. Yeah, well, but for me, I, I don't question. It's like this is what I have to do. Yeah, but you will have to do something more spectacular each time, I would imagine. Well, isn't right? everybody? I mean, what, you Well, so know? few people actually succeed in doing it. They've been very successful in doing it. Right. Well, I guess um, they're not as masochistic as I am. <laughs> I mean, might there come a time when you just take the opposite tack and appear all buttoned up and, I don't know, with a parasol or something? Well, I'm not going to tell you because then it won't be a surprise. You see, that will be another spectacle in itself. That's true. <laughs> Maybe so. it's down the road a ways, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I wanted to ask you about the whole justify my love. Brouhaha. Brouhaha, yes. Oh, but can we talk about it on MTV? I think we can. Okay. You know? Some of us wanted to see it shown on MTV, maybe mm -hmm. later. We night. won't name any names, will we, Kurt? <laughs> no, not yet. Okay. But I, w I wonder what you made of the, uh, the the subsidiary controversy with with the track being lifted from Public Enemy and Lenny Kravitz is getting a lot. Yeah, of... Yeah, but Public Enemy lifted the track from James Brown. I mean, can we if we talk well, about? Well, they say they brought musicians in to do that track. They say that's a musical track they created. Yes, but I I challenge any rap artist to talk about originality because they all rip off tracks yeah. from everybody else. I mean, that is the essence of rap music. Yeah. The uh, you know they have a, they have one would hope they have political messages or something to say in their rap, but uh, generally it's all music borrowed from other people. Yeah. So do you think this is a good thing or is it simply? Theft? I think it's inevitable. I mean, I borrow from people all the time in my work, in my videos. I pay tribute to painters and photographers yeah. and, and dancers and so on and so forth. And I, I think um, that it's inevitable. And I think one should look at it as flattery, you know, yeah. and, or sort of an homage being paid 
Might to you, somebody. I know Public Enemy has talked about maybe working with you. They could really show you how this is done. Like, Hell, I'd love to work with Public Enemy. They are my number one favorite rap group. Really? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Were you aware of the Ingrid Chavez controversy? She claimed she did the songs and you just overlaid vocals on top of it? Yes, I was aware of it, but uh, when uh, Lenny Kravitz brought me the song, I didn't know anything about yeah. the fact that he had worked with Ingrid Chavez. I mean, I was completely innocent in this situation. And Lenny brought me a track with, you know, with um, vocals, with the lyrics written, and then I came in and changed the things that I wanted to change vocally mm -hmm. or lyrically, and then did, you know, my version of it. So if Ingrid did have something to do with There's a, there's a very touching part in the movie where you, you mentioned that the great love of your life is Sean. You've mentioned this in, in uh, Vanity Fair and other mm -hmm. interviews, too. Do you, this is kind of sad. I mean, we, we seem to th I think of you now as being sort of a sad and lonely person. Is that you misapprehension? You have to think of me as being a sad and lonely person all the time, but some of the times, I think, but everybody is. And uh, at this point in my life, I could say that he is, was the great love of my life. I mean, that's why I married him. And... I think most people have that one person, you know. Yeah. I mean, the person that you're, you know, live and die for, the person that gets right down in your heart and soul, you know, and makes that big impression. I think everybody has it. I don't know. I mean, be great if it would happen again. Yeah. But um, I think most people can say they have that that one, you know. I mean, be, being Madonna is our problem of like, who's good enough for Madonna? Like, what guy could possibly live up to this? Um, well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, I don't think it's a question of who's good enough, but really who, who's, who is willing to sort of accept my lifestyle, you know, yeah. and, and be able, who's, I mean, let's face it, it's, it's, it's a tough life, lifestyle to, to live, uh, especially if you're not in it, doing it all the time. And I've, I've had years to acclimate myself to the insanity yeah. of my life. You know, other people don't, and m most people are pretty sort of want to shy away from it or frightened by it or intimidated by it and I I mean I think I've said this before in interviews my hat's off to any guy who has the balls to ask me out you know what I mean <laughs> and, then, and then I always follow up by you do know what you're getting yourself into right do you think of yourself as obsessive I mean just totally nuts about getting everything in order and in control yeah 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 I'm yeah I'm a control freak yeah that's what you're asking do you see that as a flaw or um I think it can be a flaw if if, if that's if I'm not willing to um, accept weaknesses in people and, and, you know, but on the other hand, that's one of the reasons I've accomplished so many things and yeah. because, because of that, because I've gotten, I mean, I get a lot done because uh, I work my ass off and the things I do for the most part, you know, uh, are pretty damn good. And the reason is because I, I have high expectations of myself and other people, you know, yeah. so. Do you, do you also express a desire some, at some point to have children or something? Yeah. Could you do that with the lifestyle that you have? I mean, uh, no, nice, well, right? obviously things <clears throat> would have to change. I mean, I couldn't go on tour for a certain period yeah. of my life. I, I couldn't, uh, you know, run 10 miles. I mean, uh, there would be uh, changes made, yeah. you know. But I, I have to look at it as another adventure or an something, another thing to conquer, you know what I mean? That's how I have to look at it. Yeah. You've, yeah. you've made some uh, interesting television appearances over the last year. One was on Nightline. I don't think people understand how Nightline is set up. Maybe you could explain it. It's not like some guy is talking directly no, to you. No, Nightline is insane. Well, Nightline is like being a kamikaze pilot. <laughs> uh, well, you sit there and you've got this little earpiece in your ear that you can barely hear a person talking to you on, and the person you're talking to is somewhere else, not in the yeah. room with you. and you actually can't see him because if you look at him then you're looking into the monitor so you have to look into the camera yeah. as if the person is the camera and barely hear what the person's saying and then there's a delay to what he's saying uh... so you sort of seem idiotic because you're not really sure what he said and you don't answer him right when he said it it's very uh... it's high anxiety yeah. time 
It's yeah, unusual yeah. that you would, someone who's so interested in control would put themselves in that position. I mean, where do you? Well, I, <clears throat> I am interested in control, but I often put myself in positions where I could fail miserably. I yeah. mean, any, any time a person walks on stage, anything could go wrong, and then you could fall flat on your face and look like a fool. Yeah. You know, um, but I was willing to take that risk at that particular time because um, I felt like everybody was, you know, going on the bandwagon saying why I did this and what this was about, and, and I thought, you know what, let me just try and, you know, get my point of view and uh, maybe um, calm a few nerves, or no. not calm a few nerves, explain my side of the story, you know. Yeah. Have the people at MTV come to you and said, we hope your next video will be a little more arable, or? No, no? I don't no. think so. I'm sure they're They're not that, that foolish. <laughs> You also, uh, when you appeared at the Academy Award show, you seemed to, one, there was a very tight close-up and you seemed to be a little nervous. Yes. Of course, in front of a house like that, I can understand that. Well, how about how there was a billion people watching? Yeah. Yeah, I was nervous. Did you, did you, looking back at the performance, were you happy with it and everything? Overall, God, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was just grateful I got through it. I had so many things working against me. I had, uh, um, I had never performed live with a 50-piece orchestra yeah. before, and that was daunting in itself. And then um, <clears throat> the uh, microphone that I, I sang with was supposed to come sort of telescope out of the ground. And as I was coming out of the, gr the ground, a techie underneath the stage said, your telescope, your, your microphone isn't going up. And so I'm sitting there, you know, in my very glamorous <laughs> pose, trying to look, you know, um, like perfection, you know, and <laughs> I'm thinking, great, I'm going to walk forward and there's going to be no microphone, and then what am I going to do? So I thought, well, don't look, don't panic, <laughs> just look good for the first 30 seconds, and then you can fall apart, you know, because, you know, everyone says first impressions are <laughs> the most lasting. So, of course, there was a mic stand, but it wasn't my height. And, you know, you when you do a live performance, you have to sort of get through all the things yeah. that aren't exactly perfect, and it's inevitable that something will go wrong. Yeah. And, 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 and the more experience you have dealing with those things, they are. And so I think I did pretty well. I, I would have died, I'm sure, yeah. if something like that happened. I was nervous. I was nervous. But, you know, I, I felt good about it. So. Did you, you attended this with uh, Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. of course. Was this, was this something you guys sat down and plotted out beforehand and said, we're just going to knock no, everybody's we started, socks off? No, we started working together. And uh, I didn't have a date for the Academy Awards. And, uh, a comment in itself on our culture. I think. Absolutely. <laughs> and I said, well, and, and Michael was like, well, who are you going to go with? And I said, I looked at him, I said, I don't know, you want to go? <laughs> and he said, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Did he pick you up at your house? It was one of those deals? Um, no, he didn't pick me up at my house because I was already there. I, had done, I had to do a run through yeah. of the show right before the show, so I was there ready. So he came and hung out backstage and then went out and watched the show. and my performance and then I came and sat down with him. So now afterwards, after the show and everything, did you and Michael go home together or, or, uh -huh. or what happened? Well, no, we went to um, Spago yeah. and there was a big party and we stayed there for hours and hours and hours. And, uh, and then, yes, he took me home. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now what do you want to know? What happened after that? Yeah. I'm not going to tell you. Okay. All right. I think we read books though, quite frankly. We were looking at, um, uh, <clears throat> I have tons of books on photography, yeah. so that was, that was I, that sticks out in my mind. Did they, uh, what, what did you been working on? You've done a song with him for his next album, I think, right? Well, we're it? working on a song. Yeah. It's not, we, you know, we. I'm a perfectionist. He's a perfectionist, and we've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be working with him yeah. just to have the experience. Yeah. You know, he's a great musical talent. Um, but, you know, we're going to wait and finish it and then go, okay, do we want to do this? Does he want to put it on his album? Is that the next musical statement yeah. I want to make? You know, it's... Um, this won't be like thousands of lawyers coming in to discuss it, will it? No, actually, the business aspect has already been taken care of. This is purely yeah. a creative uh, question right now. You, there's, a, there's a part in the movie where you mentioned that you're attracted to uh, s emotionally crippled people, yeah. in a way. And so I've always thought maybe Michael is, sort of fits in there. Is that fair to say something like that? Well, I... I mean, when I said I was attracted to emotionally crippled, crippled, crippled people, crippled people, I didn't name any names. I mean, the thing is, I'll, I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say I am an emotional cripple. I mean, I've... Uh, you? Yourself? Absolutely. I mean, when I say emotional cripples, I mean people that are very needy in some way or another, yeah. people that are 
fully evolved human beings, and no, I'm not, but I'm working on it. Um, and I think most performers or entertainers or actors are emotionally crippled in some way or another. Um, I think that's one of the reasons we seek out uh, other people's yeah. approval in, in the business that we are. That's why we are entertainers, quote unquote. That's why we are actors playing out different roles, you know. I think most actors, uh, performers, singers, whatever, are, are emotionally crippled in some way or yeah. another. Um, really healthy people just aren't in this business, let's face it. Do you see yourself getting better? I mean, do you notice I'm better this year than I, I was last yeah, year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, working on this movie has been a real educational experience in terms of me yeah. uh, and my emotional state of mind. I think it was a real uh, learning experience about myself, to watch myself you know, view myself, hours and hours of footage, seeing the sort of the little nuances in the way I deal with people, you know, um, how I deal with obstacles and how I deal with surprise and you know what I mean? Yeah. I, it was real educational and I, I think it was a valuable, in, in, I can't even tell you how valuable it was. I can imagine. And there's, a part, there's a part in the movie where you, you also say that um, you may not, I may not be the, uh, the world's best singer, I may not be the world's best dancer, but I don't care about that. I'm interested in pushing people's buttons. Right. I mean, do you see that as your art form? No, I see that as my... Uh, I just think that people, it's, it's pointless for people to get into a creative uh, arena and say, I want to be the best. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are, everyone has what they have. They say what they say, and you could never compare, you know, Picasso with Leger. I mean, you have to, everybody has something different to say. Um, and it's silly to get in there and say, my brush stroke is better than another person's. Yeah. You know, it's better to say, am I being true to myself? And is this what I want to say? And have I expressed myself, you know, the way I want to express myself? No. I mean, that's what it's all about. There's, so. there's, a, there's also, also a part in the film where you say that uh, this is a theatrical presentation of my music, the show, the whole yeah. tour was, mm -hmm. and there were, I think there was one lip sync part in the show, which mm -hmm. is very clear what it was. Yeah. I wonder what you, you make of, there seems to be a reaction against lip syncing and against the whole sort of artifice of uh, what yeah. a lot of pop music is. Do you have any well, moral thoughts on that? My moral thoughts are, since I'm not going around saying, uh, you know, it was never a requirement of me that I sing everything yeah. live on stage. I think of myself, as I said, as a, as a politician, as a performer, uh, as, um, as an artist. But if sometimes part of my theatrical, theatrical presentation is to have um, taped vocals while I'm doing other things, yeah. then that's, you know, and people are free to not come to my show because of that. That's their option. Uh, when you watch videos, they're not live. Everybody yeah. lip syncs, and no one seems to mind that. So, um, you know, I, to me, the, all the grumbling about whether people are singing live or not is just, I think, was started by people, by live musicians who were who are out of work, you yeah. know. And uh, we don't meet any of your musicians in this movie either, are they? Uh, no, because <clears throat> my I likened my live musicians to an orchestra in a pit in terms of servicing my show. You know, yeah. I mean, when you see. Uh, Broadway musicals, they're certainly an integral part of the show, but you don't see them. You yeah. know, I wanted a very theatrical presentation, and so I needed dancers slash actors to, to act out things, and uh, the musicians needed to concentrate on their playing their musical instruments, so I yeah. couldn't expect that of them. Um, and so you don't really see them. I think there's a. I think what some people object to in all this is maybe not just the, the stage lip syncing. It's the fact that you can go into a studio now and do a vocal, and if you hit a B flat where there should be a C or something, you can change digitally it. you can change well, it. Well, then how do they feel about all the movies they go to see? And you know, if an actor screws up a line, or you know, that's why you do 300 takes. You can make the worst actor look great in the editing room. Yeah. That's the difference between live theater and a movie. That's the difference between a live sing li live singer and and uh, a you know, a, a studio singer, but one has always had that ability to, to make a vocal better than it is ever since we've discovered, yeah. you know, you know, studio technology. And now people are acting like it's just something people started doing. It, it's ludicrous. In the end, the idea is, are you moved by this piece of music or aren't you? If yeah. you like it, then you like it, you know? If you don't, you don't for, a, a, for instinctual reasons, you know, something that you, that's on, uh, Un, uh, identifiable, something that you can't 
ne necessarily describe. Um, and you know, as far as all the whole, even the whole Milli Vanilli, you know, thing, I, I think it was really unfair to, to torture, to torture yeah. those guys because. If someone came up to you on the street and you couldn't sing, and they said, "Look, you want to? I'll yeah. make I'll make you a star, and uh, all you have to do is look great," you know, would you say no? I mean, most people, uh, I think, would have grabbed at the chance. Your everyday Joe on the street, which is, I think, if anybody was going to be hanged in the square, it was the producer who was responsible no. for it. He's the one who put the whole thing together. They were incredibly arrogant, though. And then yeah, well, I the wasn't aware of all of their <laughs> arrogance. I don't know that, but to, to, you know, I'm uh, this public blogging of people, you no. know, is so ridiculous and and so pointless. Because in the end, if you know Paula Abdul or Millie Vanilli or whoever made a record and it brought joy to somebody's life, who sure, yeah, shit, you I know? agree. But the th thing is, I mean, you can go up on stage and actually sing. And I wonder about you. Sort yeah. of wonder if any of these other people could actually get up there and sing in front of a as you did at the Oscars. There's no right. lip singing involved. You know? Right. Well. You know, but that's that's a sign of the times. I mean, there that's a different kind of a performer. Yeah. You know? And the public his uh has a need for that kind of a performer. I mean, or else these people wouldn't be successful. Yeah. You know, um you know, like the monkeys and 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 you know, the partridge family and all and the archies. I mean, there's always been a certain kind of entertainment where whether where, where real talent or whether a real musical talent or real singing talent was always a question. But you're not saying the Archies weren't great, are you? I love the Archies, okay. but who the hell was singing? I mean, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Ron Dante, one guy, I think. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but still, I mean, there was a, a form of entertainment yeah. that people uh, enjoyed. Yeah. So you're right. You're right. The, uh, it's, uh, given your, the, the fact that you plan things out quite a ways in advance, do you have a film schedule ahead? I mean, we heard that you're supposed to be doing a movie with Demi Moore. Uh, uh, I have that. a lot of <clears throat> things brewing, you know, but with movies, it's always whatever sort of gets done first. You've got to, you know, sometimes there's a script and a director and other, the cast is all ready to go. Um, and at other times, there's a script and a director, but the other person in the movie just got pregnant. Yeah which is the case with Demi, and you can't go with that right now. And other times there's the cast and the director are ready to go, but the script isn't ready. And, you know, movies are like a billion times harder to make than records because yeah. there's so many people involved, and it takes a long time. And th the movie that you think you've been going to do next for a year very often is not the movie you're going to do next. Yeah. Sometimes it's the movie you're never going to do. So it's hard to say, you know, I, but I do have a, a lot of things cooking. Yeah. Have your films turned out the way you thought they would when they finally come out? Are you sometimes surprised and say, oh my god, I didn't think it'd be like that? Uh, sometimes they have and sometimes, I mean, I've had, compared to my music career, I've had this much experience in my movie yeah. career and uh, I, I, I really want to have more. In my music career, I've had a lot more control, I've had a lot more input, I've been a big collaborator in yeah. it. Uh, in my movie career, I haven't. I've started thrown into, threw myself into it without, an all of, lot, uh, without a lot of knowledge and made a lot of mistakes because of that. But in a movie, you know, you're not in charge just because you're the yeah. actress, you're not in charge. The director makes choices, the light, the cinematographer makes choices, mm. the writer makes choices, and you okay. hope that when, you, when it's all finished, it, it works. Um, you should direct, obviously. I, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> I want to direct, yeah. Yeah, do you feel that uh, it seems like some, sometimes people from New York or sometimes people from outside of Hollywood aren't wished the best by Hollywood? I mean, do you think people are sort of against you I here? think people in Hollywood are, that live in Hollywood don't wish other people in Hollywood the best. It's that I think, kind of town. Huh? Oh, it's, don't turn your back. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, a, it's a cutthroat business, and, mm -hmm. I, and I think um, as much as the public wants to s build somebody up and see someone succeed and you know, put yeah. them on the cover of all of their magazines. And I think, I think that it's human nature to sort of uh, revel in um, someone else's failures, you know. Yeah. That's why we have the National Enquirer, you know. Um, because people are as interested in success as they are in failure. Yeah. They are as interested in strength as they are in weakness. So um, just as much as someone in Boise, Idaho, I think that, you know, Someone living down the street from me would love to see me fall flat on my yeah. face, as they would like to see me succeed. You know, it's 
So do you do you look very upon complex. It, do you look upon it as part of this is part of the deal when some awful story comes out in the Inquirer you don't yeah, get mad you say it goes with the territory and it's unfortunate, um, but it goes with the territory. Yeah. Are you hurt yeah. by this stuff? I mean, do you ever does it reduce you to tears ever to see some of the stuff that's written about you? Um, are you are you a reduced to tears kind of person? I don't know. No. <laughs> In the very beginning, I think I was very, um, I was very affected by what people said to me and what people wrote about me. But once I, you know, like anything, the more it happens to you, the more, uh, the, the better your ability is to, to, to laugh it off. Yeah. You know, um, when the nude pictures of me came out in Playboy, I was just, I mean, this was at the very beginning of yeah. my, my fame, so to speak. And I was mortified. I, I was, uh, I thought I would never work in this town again. You know, I thought that's it; my career's over with. Yeah. Um, but, but it's not obviously, and I had to sort of like, you know, dry my tears and you know make a decision. I could either walk out on the street or walk out on a stage and say, "Look, I don't, I don't give a damn," you know, and or I could run away with my tail between my yeah. legs. And the public also picks up on that, you know, and and. The frightening thing about the press and that aspect of the press is it's something that you have no control over, you yeah. know. And if you go along and you and you work really hard and you you try so hard to make things good and and then all of a sudden something comes out and you, there, you have no say in the matter, it's a, it's a frightening concept. Yeah, you've oh. since gone on to do much much better nudes, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Somebody is making so much fucking noise <laughs> over.